Good afternoon, I hope you're staying safe and well. Welcome back to another video tutorial. This is part two of our series of lessons on the poem, The Road Not Taken. We're going to go straight into uh, the poem today. I'll, I'll show you the summary of the poem uh, again, just to remind you first. But then we're going to get start, we're going to start our close reading of the poem and we'll go stanza by stanza as always. And there'll be checkpoints after each stanza just to give you time to check your understanding and kind of solidify your uh, thoughts as we go through this lesson. So let's start straight away by looking at the summary again and I'll, I'll give you a few minutes, well I'll give you a couple of minutes to have a read of that summary so you won't hear my voice initially and then we'll go sh straight into, uh, into stanza one of the poem The Road Not Taken. See you shortly. Okay, so let's just locate ourselves in the poem again. Here's our location. We're in the yellow woods and we're with the poet and we've come across this divergence in the two roads. And you can see the roads are forking off. Um, and then let's read the poem with that in mind. So we're kind of in the same shoes as the speaker. We're looking at these two options, path A and path B. And the poem is really a reflection or a meditation on the consequences of taking a particular choice and abandoning another option and whether or not uh, the, the, whether, or, whether or not we'll live to regret this decision or not. So uh, already I hope you've noticed that you know the allegory behind this poem is significant is really one about it's really what a poem that explores the consequences of decisions. I think I'm very very wary that this poem has been interpreted in lots of different ways. I don't think there is a, a, an absolute interpretation for this poem. I think it's very open-ended. I think it's very ambiguous. And I actually think it's much trickier uh, than, it, than, it, than it appears on the surface uh, to pin down the exact meaning, which is one of the reasons I love the poem, I suppose. So let's go to stanza one, and we'll do a close reading of stanza one together. See you in a second. Okay, sorry, my, my crab-like hand is in the way. Firstly, we're going to discuss and talk about the title of the poem and its significance. The title is The Road Not Taken. And I think immediately our poet Robert Frost introduces us to the hidden allegory or the subtext of the poem. The subtext just means, we've talked about it before, the story below the story. So think about other words including sub, subterranean, subway, subconscious, subliminal. So it's always below, right? So it's the hidden story. And I think he introduces this hidden story immediately, as I said. I think it introduces the kind of core theme, I suppose. And I'm cautious about saying that because I think there are other themes as well. But really, I think the core theme has something to do with decision making. The road not taken. Okay, And the road, or the roads rather, are the key symbols in the poem. I would argue that the roads represent possibilities. They represent the future. They represent alternative futures. Um, they represent alternative forks in the road. And, and literally this is a kind of metaphor for that moment in your life when you are at a fork in the road. Um, and a fork in the road, by that I just mean here's, here's a fork in the road. Our road is going along and oh look, we've got a fork. And as a speaker, here's our poet, he is deciding should I take this fork or this path? So I think it's, I can see why and I can, I can completely understand why so many teachers and so many students immediately kind of come to the conclusion that this poem is about taking a path or one path in life rather than another. So taking path A rather than path B. I think the poem is slightly more complicated than that in terms of the meaning of the poem and I'll talk about why later on. But I do think it does 
there is a there is a link to decision making. There's a link to uh, possibly to regret later on in the poem about which path you take in life. But generally, I think the the start of the poem immediately introduces us to the theme. The more subtle, in, I think, the more subtle idea comes when you look at the word not, and not in this sense is an adverb because it's describing the word taken, which is of course a verb to take. So it's the road not taken, not the road, notice the title is not the road taken, or not the chosen road, it's the one that's not taken. So I think the adverb not does introduce ideas of re regret, does introduce, so I'll put that down, regret possibly, it does introduce the idea of rumination, which is kind of like a deep reflection or a series of reflections on a decision make, made in life. I think this poem is quite rumin ruminative. I think this is sort of this is a poem that reflects the speaker's anxieties and doubts um, because he took the he didn't take this particular road. So I think for lots to go back to my drawing here of, po of the poet with the path A and B. I think let, let's say he takes path A, not path B. So this is, path B becomes the road not taken. And I think a lot of this poem is really exploring uh, or contemplating what could have been if he had taken path B. That's my, that's my understanding anyway. So that's our title. And, and again, we, we should always take some time in poetry to consider the poet's decision making when, you know, when they craft poetry, you know, is, is, is an art form uh, and, a, and the poet is a craftsman. So we need to discuss the craftsman's decision making. When we look at a sculpture or a painting, we would we analyse the painting. We talk about the decisions the painting or the art, the painter or the artist made or the sculptor made. We think about well, why did they use foreshortening? Why did they use light and dark in this way? Why did they um, why did they put this in the foreground and this in the background? It's very similar with poetry, except rather than having paints, we have language and we have words and we have syntax and we have phrases. And we have to think about, well, why did they choose these particular words? Why do they choose these particular series of words? Um, and, and think about them as being craftsmen, uh, you know, artists who make particular decisions for a reason. So we need to think about that when we're considering the title of The Road Not Taken. OK, that's our introduction to the title. Uh, we're going to have a quick checkpoint uh, on that and then we'll move on to looking at stanza one. Okay, so we've come to stanza one. Let's just have a read of the stanza and then we'll do a close reading. Two rows diverged in the yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both, and be one traveller. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could, to where it bent in the undergrowth. Okay, so we have this first opening image, which is really important. And I, again, we, we remember this poem as an allegory, and therefore our opening description two roads diverging in a yellow wood is deeply symbolic okay um, and just to remind you of what that looks like we, here are two roads road number one and road number two and they've diverged which means they've separated into two paths di equals two in greek okay or so the two roads have diverged the opposite of that would be converging so they've come back here so that's my two roads and they've come back and they've met and carried on so diverging converging two roads diverging yellow wood and I, we've talked about this already this opening line being deeply symbolic and, and referenced and, and a reference to the allegory okay the two roads could could represent you know paths in life that the poet is choosing to take uh, they could be uh, they could be more they could be even more symbolic they could represent um, 
his future and he's come to a critical junction in his life when he has to decide which road to take. So they diverge in the yellow wood. I think it's interesting and I think it's not something we should gloss over to think about the setting. Um, I think there's, it, it, I think the yellow wood, that imagery, uh, and especially the colour yellow, that introduces kind of ideas of ageing and I think ideas of mortality, uh, because clearly the the speaker has set the, or the poet poet rather has set the poem in autumn, uh, which is ob obviously associated with the yellowing of the trees' leaves, uh, the falling of the leaves, and the process of decomposition once the leaves fall. So I think there is a kind of subtle reference to mortality and that's emphasized later on so the, the kind of theme of mortality crops up later in, in the final stanza when there's a, essentially a shift forward in time so these two roads of diversion in a yellow wood um, I know I go into a lot of detail but I think it's significant to talk about the woods as a setting as well the woods represent nature they represent the wilderness they represent uh, discovery I think there's always this kind of wonderful sense uh, when you, if you ever walk into a wood, of being in, you know, in in the natural world, of being in a place that's easy to be lost in, of being in a place that's difficult to navigate, that that feels kind of timeless and 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 ancient, I suppose. So I think the wood setting is interesting because I think this is again possibly s signifying man's relationship to nature, uh, and the and the two roads are diverging in the yellow wood. What I think is immediately important to emphasize based on the first line is that um, lots of people interpret this poem as being about forging your own path. So ignoring, you know, not following other people. So let's say, let's go back to my image, path A and path B. Lots of people read this poem as being about how everyone follows path A and p the poet chooses to follow path B because they want to be different and they want to stand out from the crowd. They, want to, they, don't, they don't want to conform to, to, the, to everyone else. Um, and lots of people read this poem as being about discovery and, you know, exploration. The one, I'll, I'll say something as a cautionary note here. It's important that the road has already been created. So whatever path he follows, let's be really clear here. Whatever path the poet chooses to follow or the speaker chooses to follow, it's already been made for him by someone else. So he might, he might take the road that's less travelled by eventually, which is road B. However, it's still been travelled before. So he's still following in, in the footsteps of someone else. It's not like he's completely unique. I think that's one of the things I'll say. OK, so that's a lot about the first line. Two roads diverge in the yellow wood and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveller. I'm going to look at that entire clause because I think it, they're all, it's all kind of linked together. Uh, we've had the symbolism of the two roads. Now we have this idea of the sim symbolism of the traveller. And it reminds me of the poem Ozymandias and the, and the ancient traveller, uh, sorry, the traveller we meet in the ancient land. I think the traveller, I think that word has associations with adventure, with exploration, with discovery, with being, um, I, I would suppose, idiosyncratic, which means unique not following the crowd, not following the herd. Um, so I think that's in interesting. That he, the poet wishes that he was one traveller, wishes that he was exploring, that he was, that he was a part. Um, and I think the, em the emphasis of the word one is quite important because I think I read this poem really about being, you know, about self-discovery, about discovering your own true personality, not following other people, not becoming like other people, but forging your own identity. So I said earlier that I don't think this poem is about forging your own path, but I do think it is about forging your own identity. And, I, and it's even more complicated than that, I think, as we go through the poem, but we'll talk about that later on. The word sorry on line two, uh, and the idea that he's sorry he could not travel both roads, I think uh, introduces a, another theme, which is regret. The fact that he doesn't, that he, that he, he's sorry he can't travel both. The idea that he, um, I suppose it goes back to there's, there's an idiom, which is a kind of a common f uh, phrase that we use, a common phrase that we use in everyday speech, which is that the grass is always greener on the other side. That's the phrase that I think of, the grass is always greener on the other side. And I think that's what he means here. I, I'm sorry I could not travel both. So essentially going back again to my image of our traveller, uh, our, our poet rather, facing the choice of road A or road B, I think this is about how whatever choice he makes, he would regret not taking the other choice. So for me, 
this is more about this this reveals more about our our poet and the fact that he would be he would be regretful no matter what choice he made and it, it reminds me of you know um the, the idea of, this, of indecision uh, the fact that he is restless perhaps the fact that he has a restless soul that he that he, that he needs to he need, he he wants to see and experience and discover everything for himself and he'll regret whatever he does Long I stood and looked down as far as I could. And again, again, we, we have to remember this is an allegory, so every event and every moment in the poem is symbolic. I think the fact that he's, we've got this alliteration of long and looked, um, it kind of mirrors the actual process that the kind of that lengthy l sound imitates the process. So again, it's an act of mimesis, which we talked about earlier in the unit. Um, the process of actually standing and looking. I think even this moment where the where the we have this first person I standing there and looking down as far as he could. Even that is symbolic. I think that's about, again, going back to my picture of our man facing a choice. In fact, you know what I'll do? I'll go to a different page and I'll, I'll do it on a different page. So here's our road, here's our speaker. So that line, and look down as far as I could, he's exploring both options. He's He's kind of uh, visualizing both possible paths um, and trying to make a decision. So again, I think this does refer back to decision making as a theme this moment. Um, and, then, and then interestingly, the last line, I'll go back to the last line. The last line is to where it bent in the undergrowth. So going back to my other picture, one of the roads he's looking down as far as he can bends round. Okay. And even that, I would argue, going back to my poem, it's a bit complicated now, even this idea of the road bending is for me symbolic. The road bends uh, because obviously, well, for, it's not obvious, I shouldn't have said obviously, but I think it represents the idea that you can never know what's going to happen in the future. You can't look into the future. You can't, um, we don't have the, the, the gift of foresight or uh, prophecy. We can't look into the future and determine which path would be best. And the last image I'm going to show you on the board uh, to explain it even better. But the idea that he looks to where it bent in the undergrowth is also, I would argue, symbolism. Okay? Oops, my pencil case has fallen. Uh, and I'll show you what I mean by undergrowth and explain why it's symbolic. Okay, so here's our undergrowth. And for me, this represents, you know, it's, it's clearly in, in, the, in the poem, it, it represents an obstacle. It gets in his way, it gets in his line of vision. He can't see beyond this undergrowth. And for me, this again represents the idea of not being able to look into the future, not being able to, have, you know, not having the gift of uh, prophecy or being, a, or, 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 you know, clairvoyance, not being able to see into the future. But also, I think it goes back to, and it's our second example of natural imagery. We've had the image of the yellow woods. Now we have the undergrowth beneath the yellow woods. And for me, again, it represents this idea of the relationship to man and nature, the idea that nature and man are in kind of conflict here. The undergrowth is is go, is eventually going to grow and uh, c cover the roads themselves and and possibly take over and and perhaps if left you know if left alone the two roads would eventually disappear and be overtaken by undergrowth. So I think the undergrowth is significant. It, I, I don't want to give you all the interpretations that it could represent. I think it could represent so many different things, but I do think it's a moment of symbolism. Okay, we've come to our checkpoint for stanza one. Your questions will be appearing on the screen shortly. Um, please just a reminder to pause the video, to follow the timings, and to write in full sentences. Okay, please pause the video and I'll see you shortly.
welcome back. So I'm going to read stanza two and we'll go through the same process in terms of our close reading um, and then we'll have a checkpoint after that. I'm also going to be trying to rely, relying rather on my um, drawings to try and explain some of the concepts here. So stanza two, then took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that the passing there had worn them really about the same. Okay, so I'm just going to explain kind of what's going on here and go back to my terrible stick figure drawing um, and hopefully you can see it now. Uh, I'll get some more space on my desk. Oh, there you go. Right, so we talked about this last time. Last stanza, he looks down, let's say, road B, uh, and he sees the undergrowth that, that, that bends, here's our undergrowth, and it bends in the corner. He can't see what goes on beyond that, okay? So he looks down that road as far as he can, sees the undergrowth, uh, and sees the bend in the road, but can't see further than that. And we talked about how this undergrowth here is symbolic, okay? It's interesting in the first line, he then says, well, rather than taking road A, I actually took the other, <laughs> okay? He says, I took the other as just as fair. Um, and this is important because when he says just as fair, that fair is kind of an archaic, or a bit old-fashioned, not archaic, but an old-fashioned way of, this, of saying beautiful. So he said, he's essentially saying, I took the other path A as just as beautiful. Okay, well, so that's interesting because going back to this idea of how this poem is often misinterpreted, both path A and path B, both road A and B, are beautiful roads. So whatever road he takes, he, they're both good options, I, I suppose is what I'm trying to say. They're both options that offer beauty. They're both options that will offer him beautiful views, beautiful, you know, beautiful um, encounter with nature. Both of them do. They're both equally as fair. He says that road A has the better claim. I suppose that means that it's the one that looks more inviting. So I'll put in, inviting on the side here. So road A has the better claim. And again, I think going back to the symbolism of why it's more inviting, um, we'll talk about that in a second. But remember, it's more inviting on a symbolic level. And then he says why? Because it was grassy and wanted wear. So we learn that road A, road B rather, has the undergrowth and it bends off in the corner. Road A, here's road A, and this is my grass. Road A is grassy and wants wear. So, so he, what he means by that is, it, it's a, I suppose it's more overgrown, and it could be, and it needs to be kind of trodden down. So I suppose again, going back to the symbolism of this road of road A being grassier and wanting wear, I suppose you could argue that, that represents the idea that he's taking a path that is less travelled. So let's be really clear. Road A doesn't have as much grass and it's, and it's been worn down more. So more people take Road A than do take Road B. So he's taking the, 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 the less popular route. He's taking the route that I suppose I think is about, I think this is about conformity. And he doesn't conform. He, do, he doesn't follow the crowd. He takes his own route uh, over to the grassy uh, road. And that would make more sense and it would be more simple, the poem would be simpler if, he, if, if, if it weren't for the next line, which kind of contradicts this interpretation. He then continues, though as for the passing there had worn them really about the same. So although it's grassy, I suppose, on the sides, the actual passing of the road, so the road here, the actual passing of the road is basically the same. So they're, they're, again, going back to the choices that he talks about earlier, these choices are practically identical. So you might be confused. You might think, well, why is he writing a poem about these, you know, you said, Mr. Davis, at the beginning of the poem, that this poem is about difficult decisions. But these, this, 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 isn't a diff this isn't a particularly difficult decision. He's got two very good options. They're both, they're both uh, worn down the same. What's the allegory now? What's the symbolic meaning now? And I think this goes back to my earlier interpretation that this poem is about, more, it's, it's kind of more about the character of the speaker, then I, I think it's more about the character of the speaker than it is about the two roads. And what I think this reveals about our speaker is that whatever road he takes, A or B, he would be full of regret and he would be ref full of reflections about what would have happened if I'd taken this road, what would have happened if I'd taken this road. Um, so that's, that's what, how I interpret it. It actually reveals more about the poet and the poetic voice and the speaker of the poem perhaps, than it does about the setting of the poem. 
that either route is beautiful, both routes are, you know, beautiful encounters with nature, they're both worn down, so they've both been, you know, people have traveled these roads before, these are not, he's not traveling these roads for the first, he's not the first person. Um, however, he, I think this is about how whatever path he takes, you know, he would be thinking, ah, oh, what would have happened if I'd taken path B? Huh, what would have happened if I'd taken path A? So for me, this is about the, the, the character of the speaker. Okay, that was a shorter, um, close reading, uh, but we're going to have another checkpoint. Okay, as always, please follow the timings that I've recommended and take more time if you need it, it's absolutely fine. And please respond to the questions I've posed to you in full sentences. So, take, uh, make sure you're... Uh, you're writing in your exercise books, and I'll see you shortly. Please pause the video. Welcome back. Nice to see you all. That marks the end of part two of this, video, of this video tutorial series on the poem The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. Next lesson we'll be looking at stanzas three and four and kind of um, casting, an over, casting our eye as a, on an overview of the entire poem uh, and looking at the themes, the imagery, the atmosphere, etc, uh, etc. Et so I'll see you next time for part three. Stay safe and stay well. Goodbye.